Hello and welcome to Goodwood and congratulations on making the decision to become a Spitfire pilot. Excellent choice. I hope you find this series of videos useful. Uh, we're not going to be teaching dogfighting or anything like that. We're imagining that we're flying a restored uh, Spitfire and displaying her and treating her very gently and making sure that she lasts for years to come. But hopefully by the end of this you'll know everything you need to know uh, the ins and outs of flying this beautiful Spitfire and keeping her in the air. So this is what we're going to cover in the first section. We're going to look at the variants available in this A to A AccuSim package. We're going to look at the main exterior features of the Spitfire. We're going to have a cockpit tour, both of the Mark I and the Mark II. And also we're going to talk about the main challenges of flying the Spitfire. And so not one, not two, but three different Spitfires we can fly here. We've got the Mark 1A that's got a Merlin Mark 3 engine that runs on 87 octane fuel and gives us a plus 6 PSI max boost. Or we've got the Mark 2 and that's got a Merlin Mark 12 engine and that takes the 100 octane fuel. It's got a beefier block, slightly increased supercharger and it's capable of a higher plus 12 PSI boost. The Mark 1A has got eight uh, branding 303 machine guns. The Mark 2A has got the same, but the Mark 2B has got four branding 303 machine guns and two whopping great big cannons. Now it's up to you which one ultimately you choose to fly. Some people prefer the Mark 1, some people prefer the Mark 2. I personally like the Mark 2A. Uh, another thing you can do with this is you can fit different propellers, but we're going to come on to that in a little bit because that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Ah, oh, isn't she beautiful? So what we're going to do now is just walk around the exterior of the aircraft, just looking at some uh, certain sections of it that are of interest. Just some things to point out. Just gives you a slightly better understanding of what bits are where and what they're doing. So starting here under the starboard wing, we have the all important pitot tube, which is very useful for uh, measuring our airspeed. This aircraft is also equipped with pitot heat, which is uh, very useful under certain circumstances. Moving along this incredibly thin, beautiful wing, we have our oil cooler, uh, which uh, again is a, an important piece of equipment. This is a uh, hot aircraft. We have our carburetor air intake in the center line there. And then we have our radiator, which you will know and come to love. It's an art in itself, keeping that happy. Uh, as you can see from the back here, we have different uh, positions, which are governed by a flap within the aircraft. And one of the issues with this radiator is when the flaps are down, you can see the air is blocked really from escaping and that causes heat to increase, which can become a problem. Here on the top of the wing, we have our little red indicator here that shows whether the gear is up or down. That's a useful backup. And over here we have the pressure release valve for the coolant. If you see steam coming out of there, as we have here, then you know you've overcooked your engine and everyone knows that you are mistreating it. Now the wings in our Spitfire are so thin that for the flaps to lower, an actuator arm has to pop out the top of the wing. And that pops up a flap which shows you that the flaps are down, which is a useful little visual cue. Looking at the lights here, we've got a down selector switch that lowers the lights and then we've got left or right or off in the centre position. You have to be careful you're not travelling too fast and uh, having the lights down at the same time. So moving around the back now, we have our rudder trim tab, which is controlled by this little wheel in the cockpit. And then we also have our elevator trim tab, which is controlled by this wheel in the cockpit. Very useful. You probably know already about trim, um, but very useful. Now here's one for the Morse code enthusiasts. We have our recognition lights. You can either have it on permanently or by flicking the switch up here, you can tap out some Morse code on it. Now that's for the uh, dorsal light on the top. And now we have a ventral light on the bottom. Works exactly the same way. If you want to do some Morse code to your friends as you fly in formation, then you can crack on. And what aircraft would be complete without some nav lights? Here we have a little switch top left of the instrument panel, turns on our lights. 
Okay, let's talk propellers, our three different types that we have. We've got the Weybridge fixed pitch two blade wooden propeller. Only the first 77 Spitfire Mark 1s were fitted with it. It's designed for top speed. It reaches its top speed at the altitude at which the Merlin creates the most horsepower, which is 18,000 feet running at 3,000 RPM. Trade off is poor takeoff performance, which we will see shortly. On the plus side, it's cheap and easy to maintain. Then we've got the de Havilland three-bladed two-pitch variable. Now we're making some progress. With this propeller we have two different settings, high and low, fine and coarse. This gives us the ability to select fine for takeoff and climb and coarse for high airspeed phases. For example, cruise uh, to reach top speed or high altitude. Now what the pilots found, and we know how fighter pilots like to push their machines, was if they make very careful adjustments with the two-position lever, they can actually achieve pitches in between, and we'll talk more about that. Now we've reached our spit prop in Havana. This is the Rotol Constant Speed. With this propeller, uh, you'll notice it's slightly wider along the length of the blade than our two pitch. We can set our prop lever to the desired speed, or RPM, and the constant speed governor is gonna make sure that it maintains it. In certain circumstances that won't happen, and we'll cover those when we uh, come into this in a bit more detail later. Um, but essentially, this is giving us much more control over our aircraft and uh, really just giving us more gears in our bike. And there you can see the difference in takeoff length that uh, we achieve with our three different propellers. You can see there's a huge difference between our uh, wooden fixed pitch and our Rotol constant speed. Okay, so now it's time to actually get in these aircraft and have a look and see what they're all about. As I said, that we've got two different uh, types. We've got the Mark I and the Mark II, and there are some differences between the two uh, in terms of the cockpit layout. So we're going to start off really by having a look at the Mark I, covering all of that off, and then we'll jump into the Mark II, and we'll just see where there are some, uh, some subtle differences. Okay, so here we are in the cockpit of the Mark I, and uh, let's just uh, have a quick look around. So starting from left to right, First of all, over here we have our door, which you can uh, open and close, as is traditional with doors in most cases. Uh, we have our rudder trim control, which of course we've seen before. If I just get my head down here, you can see this is the, the pito heat over here. And the switch next to it on the right is the, uh, the camera gun master switch, which we're not really going to be using, so we don't need to worry about that too much. We have a little map box here, and if you click on that, you open up your little map, which is uh, is quite handy. Let's put that back in there, close there, and also marked on the uh, the top of the map box here, you can see radiator flap shut open. This is relating to this lever here. This is our radiator flap that you saw just before um, being uh, actuated on the back of the radiator, but basically we can move that around as we see fit and the red triangle really is the optimum aerodynamic position so once you're up and cleaned up and uh, in the cruise and all that good stuff that's really where you want it um, it uh, obviously reducing the cooling effect but it is making your aircraft more dynamic because that can have quite an effect on your on your speed uh, over here we have our uh, nose um, our elevator trim wheel that you've seen before. This interesting thing here is the uh, propeller lever. It looks more to me like a plunger really, but uh, in this position here we are uh, fully fine. And in this position here we are fully coarse. But as I was saying, in between the two, there is room for maneuver, uh, which we will go into. Here we have our throttle quadrant, very simply. We've got our throttle. We have got our um, mixture. Now, uh, just to confuse us, if you have flown something like a Cessna, in the Spitfire, rich is over here in the back position and uh, lean or weak, uh, as it is in here, is in the forward position there. So that's always just something to uh, remember because sometimes you, you think you've got it in the right position, you actually haven't. Um, just something quickly, you notice when I moved the throttle forward, it actuated this little switch here, 
and that gives us our up or down indication on the the landing gear when the aircraft is sitting going nowhere it's best just to have that switched off because it does serve uh, it does save battery power and something that this uh, aircraft does very well is is model battery power in fact it's worth making the point now what accusim if you haven't come across it before essentially does is give you a living breathing aircraft that is in a persistent state so if i leave this now with all the switches on and run the battery down next time i come to use it i'll have a flat battery um, and this is what makes it more of a challenge and what makes it more interesting because you really do have to look after them you can't uh, you can't damage them and then load them up next time and everything's back to normal so it teaches you to just keep an eye on these these little things um, here we have the uh, the uh, boost cutout we'll talk about more of that later but really this is just giving you if you absolutely needed to in a wartime situation have that extra boost you just flick that forward and then depending on the engine um, it'll give you a certain amount of extra boost but only for a very short period because uh, the engine doesn't like it very much but we'll talk more about that in the future over here these funny little things uh, over here we have the that's the landing gear horn silencer if it's driving you absolutely mad um, when you're running at low throttle and the engine horn the the undercarriage um, horn is going off in your ear then you can uh, you can switch it off and here you can just about see how that's working when I pull the throttle all the way back it's pressing on that trigger and that uh, will cause the horn to actually sound and also you can do it as a way of just testing that it's working beforehand okay so over here we have our radio uh, this has a two position lever on the top uh, that is to receive and that is to transmit down at the bottom we have this lever here which is what we use to actually dial in our frequency if you've got tool tips um, up uh, or cockpit uh, tool tips then you'll be able to see your frequency that you're dialing in just there over here we have our uh, left and right or number one and number two magnetos we've got our um, pneumatic uh, brake supply pressure indicators over here for our brakes so at the moment looking at this it's showing us uh, around about 150 uh, psi in the supply but nothing actually applied to the brakes because the brakes are off if i quickly move that you'll see that we've got 80 both sides and our supply has gone down a bit because we're using it we've got our uh, elevator trim indicator our up down indicator on the gear which is what I spoke about just before we have a clock which uh, you have to wind because this is the 1940s after all we've got our oxygen regulator here we've got uh, dial showing how much oxygen we've got and then we've got another indicator here that shows you uh, or, or rather where you actually dial in the uh, the altitude um, that you are trying to regulate the oxygen for over here because uh, it's linked to this this is actually our oxygen master valve so we can turn that on using that and then if we want to actually put our mask on we would click on that and there you can hear as they're sucking on the oxygen so that just um jumping ahead a little bit there but just wanted to show you that bit yeah we can take that off now thank you um don't need oxygen down here uh we have got our nav lights showed you those before we've got a flap control this lovely big lever and in the Mark 1 we also have this fantastic indicator here. I don't know what it is about it, I just like it, but essentially, there you go. It's just another way of checking. We've got our indicator here on the wing that I told you about before, and we've got a, a nice indicator here. Interestingly, you see it calls, uh, it, calls it a brake flap. Um, I think what's really interesting in the Spitfire is that the, the flaps really are very much like a brake. Um, you use them in a slightly different way than say you would a Cessna and you tend to use it uh, really closer to the point of um, of actually landing touching down if you like to really lose some speed because it does have quite a dramatic effect you're literally just dropping that big um, metal uh, face into the air 
Moving over here we have our reflector sight which we won't be needing but as you can see if we needed to shoot anyone down we can do and then we've also got this uh, kind of slightly opaque glass just to uh, help us with our aim so that we're not getting dazzled by any bright light. Uh, we can switch that off and then underneath here you've got a control for night or day. These all work on this. Um, it's just incredible how much they've uh, they A to A have modelled it. Uh, it's quite a work of art. Coming back down here, we have our standard uh, controls that you would see in most aircraft. Uh, this uh, airspeed indicator here is, of course, in miles an hour because we're British and this is the 1940s. Got an artificial horizon. We've got our vertical speed indicator. We've got our turn and slip indicator. We've got our gyro, which we link up with our compass down here. And we've got our altimeter over here. Just moving out down here, we have our uh, port and starboard landing lamps. We've got our um, lever to, to drop the landing lamps or retract them. And then we can change the angle with the, uh, with the beam here. This feature was uh, dropped on, on later models. Now over here, if I can just get to it, this is your uh, magnetic um, correction for the compass. Just a, a nice little card there, which uh, which gives you um, gives you a more accurate steer. We've got our interior floodlights. Now the, they're the controls, and then the floodlights are here and here, and you can uh, you can move those around, as you can see. Um, we have got our fuel cocks top and bottom the top tank feeds into the bottom tank uh, in the mark one jumping ahead a little bit but in the mark one we actually have a top and a bottom fuel tank uh, indicator in the mark two we just have the bottom one so you kind of have to uh, do your maths in your head until you get down into the uh, into the bottom tank but to check them we're pressing these buttons here and as you can see we've got nothing in the top but we have got uh, what's that about uh, 26 gallons in the bottom okay so uh, starter switch um, probably one of the most important buttons we'll see more of that in a bit up at the top we've got a voltmeter now the voltmeter is is really telling us what effect uh, or what the draw is on the the electrical system and the amps is telling us what that load actually is and again this is all modeled in the uh, in the a to a spit uh, the mark ii um, doesn't have both of these in there but i'll show you those uh, it's only got the i think it's only got the voltmeter in there um, we've got the generator switch over here uh, this is helping to uh, charge the battery uh, and also produce electricity when the when the engine is actually running. We've got our RPM indicator. We've got our boost pressure. Now, uh, in the Cessna, that would be your uh, your manifold um, pressure. Slightly different way of measuring it with this. Basically, the zero is a uh, is kind of like a standardised pressure at sea level, um, and the the boost is then kind of measured around that so it's slightly different the manifold um, pressure indicator would uh, would you know say for example like now we're sitting at a uh, aerodrome um, altitude if you looked at that the manifold pressure indicator would be uh, would actually be telling you um, basically what the atmospheric pressure was at that point slightly different in the spit with the boost the boost here is zero that nominal um, uh, sea level atmospheric pressure setting uh, and it uh, changes around that so when we are uh, when the throttle is down low and the engine is running and there's more suction of course that's going to drop down into the into the minus figure and conversely when we add throttle and we're increasing the pressure then that boost is going to increase past the the zero and usually in the Mark II, for example, we're cruising at around about boost plus two. Then we've got our uh, fuel and oil pressure gauges. 
our oil temperature gauge and our radiator temperature gauge this is something that you're going to be looking at quite a lot especially when you're on the ground this is almost like a ticking clock you've got about 10 minutes to get airborne in a spit before she starts uh, boiling over um, so you get quite used to to watching this certainly anything over 100 you shouldn't really be taking off but we'll talk more about that in a bit in the mark one we have a starter mag we don't have that in the mark two and as i said we've got our two fuel tanks here over here we've got our primer so we would turn that there unscrew it and then give it some fuel you notice there's a slight difference in sound because there was uh, the fuel cocks were turned off if i now do it again slight difference and over here we have our slow running cutout now this is this is one of those little interesting things um, where I found it quite interesting. I only found out about this re recently really how it actually works. Knew, knew what to do with it, but in the, the engine you have a, a mechanism that ensures that when the, um, when the engine is slow running, when the throttle is pulled back, it will keep ticking over. And what this little gizmo does is that back in the Second World War, they you know it was all about getting into the air quickly getting the aircraft fired up again taking to the skies to take on the threat so they didn't want the system to be completely drained of fuel they wanted it to be drained to the point where the system was uh, you know was clean as it were but um, they wanted to make sure that there was a little bit of juice there in the piston so that um, when everything started uh, going hell for leather and they were ringing the bell you could start the engine up pretty quickly and that's what that does uh, when you when you're shutting down the engine and it starts to splutter and you'll see that when we get to that section we pull that just as the engine's spluttering it completely cuts the engine but what it leaves is just a tiny bit of fuel left in the tubes so that uh, when we need it to start running again it's uh, it's there for us just a it's one of the fascinating things about an aircraft like this when you remember that this was born this wasn't born to look beautiful or to be fun to fly. This was born to take a human being and some guns up into the air so that the human being could aim the guns and do some damage to the enemy. And everything is built around that. It just so happens that in designing it, they built probably the most beautiful aircraft ever produced. But I'm probably just biased. Um, but that's one of the neat little things that uh, that come out of it. Uh, over here we have our, um, these are spare bulbs for the uh, gun sight. These actually don't do anything, but they're just modelled in the aircraft. Um, but uh, you imagine if you were in a dogfight and you suddenly had to start unscrewing down here, changing the bulbs. Meanwhile, you're trying, to, you're trying to fly the aircraft, you're trying to fight the aircraft because you've got a guy in front of you maybe and also perhaps you've got a guy on your tail. So uh, that could have been quite interesting little feature here that um, is worth pointing out you've got a uh, cockpit ventilation system here um, one of the advantages of track AR is you can stick your head out of the cockpit see this little vent here if it starts to get a bit steamed up inside which again is modeled by a to a then you can just uh, open up the vent just a neat little thing it's quite useful if you've um, uh, especially if you're sitting in you know if it's a rainy day you're sitting in the aircraft you've got the canopy closed because it's uh, it's raining and it starts to mist up you can just pop that open a bit and it, it helps certainly with the engine running and again if you are um, you know if you make a sudden drop in altitude sometimes the the inside might uh, you might get condensation on the inside then that's what you need to be looking for um, over here we have our pump for the uh, landing gear on the mark one uh, we don't have a a nice uh, you know already hydraulic system uh, this is you are actually gonna have to um, pump it uh, so you would set your gear using this lever whether you want to lower it or you want to raise it and then you pump like hell with this thing until you get good indication there and you get good indication on the wing. Incidentally, these wing, in, wing, wing indicators, when the red stick is up like that, then that means that, uh, that your gear is down. 
uh, when it, as it says here, when it's flush with the wing, then that's when your um, gear is retracted. Just a useful extra step. Uh, we've got our recognition lamps that we talked about just earlier on. Window de-icing. If you get ice on the windscreen, you can uh, you can turn that on, and then it uh, oozes de-icer down at the bottom here, and then it covers the top. Uh, we have a harness release here, not really modelled in here because, uh, like you, I'm sitting in a nice comfy chair at a desk. Uh, but if we were in the real thing and we want to move forward so that we can stretch forward and have a look at something, this harness will just give you a bit of, this harness release rather, just gives you a bit of play in the harness so that you can actually move forward, but we don't have to worry about that too much. We've got our emergency uh, landing gear um, lowering bottle here it's just a one use but if if none of this is working you can fire that and hopefully that will inject a bit of uh, co2 into the system and, and push that down and then we've got our oxygen system as we talked about before uh, and that really covers uh, covers that there just looking to see if there's anything else that i potentially have missed out in the mark one uh, I think that's it. I was just going to quickly talk about this here. This is, um, you may have heard of Pipsqueak. Um, this is obviously not really modelled because we're not in World War II. This is a, uh, we're in the modern world now and it's not something that's modelled in, um, in P3D but uh, they would have used this. This used to, when it was activated for, I think it was 14 seconds of every minute, it sends out a signal and uh, the controllers can then uh, use that signal to um, first of all uh, identification friend and foe but also potentially uh, get a bearing get a position on an aircraft and potentially vector them uh, to um, to the enemy or if needs be vector them to a recovery airfield or the home air base but that's uh, that's quite an interesting little thing. Again, you won't be using it in this, but it's worth uh, it's worth knowing what it's all about. Uh, just something to point out on the stick, actually, which is kind of cool with the Spitfire. Um, obviously, we've got forward and back movement where the whole length of the stick is moving, but the uh, left and right, or the aerolons, we just have this top bit moving, and that was quite an interesting little feature. If you imagine your legs are either side of that stick um, it's quite handy just having the top bit move because otherwise you've got that whole stick moving um, and bashing into your legs so because the Spitfire cockpit is, is so cramped and it this sort of being in the sim like this doesn't quite get across just how cramped it is um, that is a is a great little feature So here we are in the Mark II, and as you can see, that uh, it's slightly different. There's a lot that's the same. Um, we haven't got our lovely little flap indicator here. Uh, we have to uh, really use our brains, but also uh, have a look over here in the wing and, and see the little flap in the in the wing there. Uh, we've just got the voltmeter here. We don't have the ammeter. We just have the bottom fuel tank. If you've seen the film Dunkirk, you've probably seen the bit where uh, he's chalking up his fuel. So we've got a nice little virtual chalk space there. Um, over here we have our Kaufman cartridge reloader. Um, we'll talk more about that in the future, but this has a slightly different... The Mark II has a different way of starting it. The Mark I uses an electric starter with a, uh, a ground uh, cart uh, or it's best to use the ground cart anyway because it saves the aircraft battery. Um, in this Mark II we have a Kaufman starter system the which essentially is a dirty great big um, shotgun cartridge uh, which when it is fired it uh, produces hot expanding gas which then goes into the engine drives the engine round um, and uh, and essentially starts the engine. Um, the great thing about the Kaufman system is that you don't need a, uh, a ground cartridge, and sorry, a ground um, cart. And one of the issues with these um, it was really power carts was uh, the you didn't have one for every aircraft. 
So when you want to get a whole group of aircraft up in the air, it's actually a lot easier just to uh, just to have these cartridges in the aircraft so it's ready to go. It's like a portable starting system. Obviously the disadvantage is you can only carry three. So when you when you fired all three, um, then uh, you've run out of cartridges. But um, it's a pretty clever idea really for the the time uh, where they they just needed to get as many aircraft into the air as quickly as they could. Again, it's, it's something that's kind of born out of necessity uh, from the war. Um, what else have we got different? We've got a slightly different positioning here with our uh, recognition lights, but nothing particularly different. Um, otherwise, it is pretty much the same same beast. We've got this funny little thing over here. This isn't. Uh, it doesn't do anything in the sim. Uh, this is a, a gun camera control. Um, but uh, nothing kind of works on it, but it's just there for aesthetics. Um, and we're certainly not uh, going to be shooting anyone down. Um, this is the cockpit that I'm I'm more used to. Um, I do like the Mark II. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, essentially, this is pretty much the, the same beast as the, uh, the Mark I with just a couple of slight differences. So, something I want to show you. I was talking about these aircraft being um, living, breathing aircraft, and uh, I want to show you the maintenance hangar. Now, this is a great feature. This is one of the things that bring these aircraft to life um, compared to your kind of standard, um, your standard simulator aircraft, uh, which is you know kind of works, and then you come to it the next day and it works again. Um, these these do have a life and you can damage them and you do need to be careful of them so this particular one this mark 2a this is the one that i'm tending to fly most at the moment so it's got 125.8 hours on the airframe and also the engine um, this actually is also the aircraft that i used as the silver spitfire and flew it around the world so that's why this has got a lot of hours on it um, i've repainted it here for um, to um to really you know as a tribute to the uh to the bolt b uh gilder tr9 spitfire two-seater spitfire which i was lucky enough to fly in a few years ago um should actually say uh kurt lewis he is one of the a to a uh misfit squadron pilots he's actually also a real uh warbird pilot in real life and he's an airline pilot and he's living the dream and he's a damn good repainter so he did this um, I was looking for a repaint to use in these videos and he did it so big thanks to him and for you coming to this perhaps new um, there's a whole host of repaints available through the A2A community uh, for all the different aircraft they do and I, they're, they're absolutely fantastic anyway so that's where we are with this uh, the report is saying nice condition uh, there's no notes because there's nothing for the uh, mechanic to report we can check our engine Everything here is in the green. If there was any damage, these would be in different color states. So yellow is, is you know, warning and red is kaput. Um, so at the moment, everything's in the green and we can do a quick compression test. And you can see they're still in the green, but you can see how all the hours are kind of building up now and they're starting to, uh, to lose a little bit of compression. So yeah, uh, oh the other thing is, this is where you would swap out, remember we were talking about the propellers, this is where you would swap those out. And you can change it on the fly, you can change it in the sim. On the Mark 1 you've also got the option to change the canopy from the bubble canopy to the earlier kind of more straight flush canopy. And if it all goes wrong and you completely, completely ruin your aircraft and you want to, you can do a complete overhaul which uh, essentially gives you gives you new aircraft so that's the maintenance hangar but what about how do we refuel uh, how do we do all those things so we go to our payload and fuel manager um, now you can even you can even load ammunition in um, and really you know obviously you're not going to shoot it but what that does is it adds extra weight to the aircraft so it's simulating that extra weight but what you can do here is you can top up your uh, glycol, um, your engine oil, your hydraulic fluid, your, your pneumatic air, uh, and we will just go through those now. And we will just top those up. 
you've got your Kaufman starter cartridges. We've got two left because we started one before. So let's top that up to three. And also over here, we can change our fuel. We're in the Mark II, so I'm running 100 octane. And we can change our oil grade as well from summer, to normal, winter. And all these things do have an effect on the aircraft. Um, it's incredible how detailed this model is. And I think that's one of the big reasons why someone like Bulby has used this technology um, converted to a Mark 9 to actually teach people how to fly the Spitfire um, because it just does model so much. It's absolutely incredible. Blows my mind that we have an opportunity to fly something like this. Um, and it's great that, uh, that you have come to it. Something we also have um, is a little control panel here. This is quite useful for adjusting different things. You can adjust volumes. Um, you can uh, you can select cold start if you want to make sure everything is zeroed. You select your cold start. If you can't be bothered to to do go through the whole um, startup procedure, you can auto start it and it'll do that for you. Um, what else have we got? Uh, we've got damage on. You can change uh, some of the, um, the the throttle gate position. You can change volumes on the sound for the, the Accusim sound that's actually within the, the simulation. You've got the ability to change some of the settings here. You can, uh, let's see if I pop outside and swing around. You can see we've got a, we've got a pilot sitting there. If I open that, then we can get rid of the pilot um, and uh, we can change lights. Um, just gives you a bit of extra control. You can also change the radiator flap. I tend to have controls um, actually uh, set up for those on uh, on my throttle quadrant. Um, but you can, you know, it's just an easier way of getting to it really when you need to, when you need to get to it. And then uh, you shift to menu is pilot's notes. This is actually really useful, especially when you're starting out. It'll tell you your current situation when you're flying. It tells you your outside temperature. Um, it gives you your optimum power settings. If you can't remember what those are, it gives you some notes here on the first page, but also you've got a checklist. Now you, you get a checklist with the aircraft. Um, but if you want a, a quick rough and ready and you know very accurate checklist you've actually got one built into the sim and that's quite a useful feature um, especially when you're practicing to start off with and for example when you're looking at doing um, uh, you know run-ups and that kind of thing it's uh, it's very useful for that um, incidentally I just want to show you because I think this is really good um, obviously, when you're doing a run-up and you've got uh, you've got the guys, um, or you've got a lot of power uh, coming through the engine. There's a tendency uh, for it to uh, nose over. So the way around that is that they got a couple of chaps to hold the tail down, and that's what these guys are doing. So uh, he's looking up then as if to say, "Why the hell are we doing this? The engine is not running." But don't worry, lads. There is a reason for it. But there you go, just a nice little thing that they modelled in there as well. And that does work, trust me. If you don't have them holding down your tail and you open up the throttle to do a run-up check, you're going to nose over, guaranteed. So uh, yeah, that's that's quite a, a useful little panel that does various things for you. So it's the challenges that make this aircraft really interesting and kind of differentiate it from a kind of a stock sim aircraft where everything's too easy. One of the first things to talk about is the ground handling of the Spitfire. Um, it's known for being uh, quite tough and this is largely down to the way the landing gear is configured. If we look for example here at this uh, beautiful Harvard uh, you can see that the landing gear is nicely spread apart and it's folding uh, inwards as it were the the actual uh, landing gear legs are out on the wing and it's folding inwards into the into the underside of the aircraft into the fuselage side if we look at this mustang very similar circumstances here nice wide track on the undercarriage giving us plenty of nice ground stability as we're mooching around uh, whether we're taxiing or landing or taking off 
uh, that's giving us some good stability. Now look at the Spitfire. Look at how narrow that is. Now that's really for a reason because the wings on the Spitfire were so thin to give it that speed, to give it that aerodynamic um, shape. The undercarriage has to fold in a different way. And what that then creates is these narrow, uh, this narrow track on the legs. And this means that you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful taxing. Uh, you can't take a, a, a turn too quickly or you're going to tip the wing over. You've got to be careful on the takeoff roll. You've got to be careful on the landing as well. So it keeps you on your toes. And uh, that's just the, the first challenge. And this is the next challenge, my friends, the old steamy situation. The Spitfire will uh, overheat very quickly on the ground. One of the things that it's worth practicing when you first get your Spitfire is go through the checks, especially the run up check um, as early as you can really and keep repeating them until you can do them very quickly without thinking. It's also worth bearing in mind that there's absolutely no point parking your Spitfire at a modern airport a great distance away from the runway that you're flying from. By the time you taxi it out there, chances are you're going to be steaming anyway. So um, just uh, bear that in mind as well. And keep an eye on your gauges. And when you are in the air, be very careful, uh, be mindful of your radiator positioning, uh, of your RPM if you are if your oil is too hot for example um, then you know you're probably running the engine too high but also you probably need to back off on the RPM just to uh, reduce the the friction but also with the uh, with the coolant temperature you know if you run it on uh, high boost and also high RPM for any length of time you're going to overheat the engine so it's just something you have to be more mindful of. Other aircraft like the Mustang will do it all for you. With the Spitfire, you have to learn to uh, to look after it. But it's again, it's probably one of the key things that you have to master uh, at the beginning. And it, it was something we'll be going to in more depth. Remember, the flaps can have a huge effect on the radiator. So as soon as you've landed, get those flaps back up and drop them in the air at the last minute. It's also a good idea to get in the habit of as soon as you have lifted off and you're happy with your speeds uh, is to pull back on the power to climb power as soon as you can. That can really help with keeping those temperatures low just after takeoff when you've just really opened the engine full out. The other challenge we have is this great big huge nose here. Um, it's not that easy to see over it when you're taxing or when you're doing an approach. So we tend to do a curved approach quite close to the airfield. And when we're taxiing, we tend to do S turns so that we can keep an eye out on what's in front of us and we don't bang into anything. So here we are at the end of part one now, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Uh, hopefully we've covered uh, pretty much everything we needed to at this stage of the uh, the series. Uh, the next stage we're going to be moving into starting the aircraft up, taxiing it, doing run-ups, getting more in-depth into the systems. And uh, I look forward to seeing you then.